I think the, the first thing to say is that we don't want to minimize uh, Maharishi's achievements. Teaching TM to millions of people around the world, and when we say TM, we mean the technique of transcendence, was perhaps the greatest spiritual development enterprise in known history. And millions of people were learning TM, Tens of thousands of people were becoming TM teachers uh, and learning advanced techniques. TM centers were being established around the world. It was a huge accomplishment, and it all proceeded from the, the brilliance and the intense focus and leadership and energy of one person, and that was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Strangely enough, from the late 70s, through a series of strange projects like World Government of the Age of Enlightenment, public yogic flying competitions and uh, one thing and another, he started to dismantle the whole organization so that by now uh, it, it, there's, you could say, almost nothing left uh, in terms of the number of people uh, learning to meditate. So it was a, a, a strange phenomenon, and now we find in the last few months it's become very clear, although some people were telling us um, years ago that his personal behavior left very much to be desired. He was taking advantage of, of young women. The reason for today's talk, for which we're very grateful to Susan, is that there will be some people, there will continue to be some people who are in denial about this fact. And really the evidence is becoming overwhelming. And Susan's going to walk us through the evidence. Susan practiced Marshi's TM for many hours daily in, in the Himalayas, the Swiss Alps, and other areas with serving Marishi. She served on Marishi's personal staff for you know, six years in Spain, Mallorca, Austria, Italy, and Switzerland. She's the author of 20 books, many of them published by major publishing houses, and she's won 46 uh, prestigious book awards. Uh, uh, she, has, she holds a, a doctorate in divinity, and she's done over 700 speaking engagements and over 1,300 media appearances. So we're very fortunate to have Susan with us, who has been studying this whole question, and to help us understand the, the tremendous dichotomy between the brilliance, more than brilliance, the genius of this individual, Maharishi, and at the same time, the tawdriness and the cheapness of his personal life, which is only coming to the surface. And how we can possibly understand these two things, it's very difficult for us all. And we can have more discussion about that. So without rabbiting on myself any further, it's a great pleasure to introduce Susan. And so Susan, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. So today's presentation, Maharishi After Dark, Many Loves of the Yogi. Uh, these are some of my books, by the way. And uh, this is my latest book, The Inner Light, How India Influenced the Beatles. 
which by the way, um, is a very detailed book. It's got uh, 912 pages, 170 very rare photos, 130 QR codes, and very well researched with 950 endnotes. So it's quite a big fat uh, tome. And also, as Brian mentioned, my memoir has won 13 book awards, Maharishi and Me, Seeking Enlightenment with the Beatles Guru. Also, I was featured in the movie, The Beatles in India, which many people have seen on airplanes because <laughs> that's uh, widely distributed on airplanes. And also I was in another film here, there and everywhere. So just to prove that, yes, I really was with Maharishi, here I am. I'm this person over here. Um, just use a laser pointer here. I'm this person here. <laughs> and uh, that's in Bangalore in June of 1970. So this is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's uh, passport, where he claims to be Bal Brahmachari Mahesh Yogi. And Bal Brahmachari means child or baby, child celibate. So it means that he was a celibate from birth, according to his passport. Okay, so Mia Farrow, <clears throat> she was a multiple award-winning actress. She was married to Frank Sinatra, and later she was married to Woody Allen. So this is on January 22nd, 1968. Maharshi's lecturing in Sanders Theater at the Harvard Law School Forum in Cambridge. And that's where he met Mia and Prudence. Then Maharishi covered first class airline, hotel, taxi, and sightseeing expenses for the Pharaoh sisters. And he traveled with them on January 24th from New York to London, Paris, Bombay, and New Delhi on their way to Rishikesh. This is uh, them traveling to Rishikesh. Once they got to Rishikesh, th by the way, this is Maharishi's bungalow in Rishikesh. On Mia's birthday, February 9th, lavish flowers, balloons, pennants, candles, and incense festooned the hall. Maharishi placed a silver paper crown on her head. Students presented 50 gifts provided by, by Maharishi, which Mia accepted with smiles and variations on the theme, quote, wow, just look at that, unquote. <clears throat> Afterward, at a private gathering, in an, an abrasive tone, Mia vented uncensored feelings, quote, I'm so effing mad. Have you ever seen anything like it? I feel like an idiot up on that stage with everyone bowing down to me, unquote. She raised a glass of champagne, quote, to the last night in this holy place. Ha, huh, that's a laugh. Maharishi is no saint. He made a pass at me when I was over at his house before dinner. Stunned, Maharishi's publicist, Nancy Jackson, asked how she could say something like that. And Mia insisted, quote, look, I'm no effing dumbbell. I know a pass when I see one, end quote. Mia described that Maharishi made her kneel before an altar. He performed puja to Guru Dev and placed a garland around her neck. Then, quote, he started to stroke my hair, unquote. When people tried to convince her this was an honor, Maharishi was blessing her. She insisted, quote, listen, I know a pass from a puja, end quote. Next morning, Maharishi placed Mia front and center in a group photograph, wearing her silver crown. She feigned a happy face and promised to return after visiting Kathmandu and Goa with her brother, John. After the Beatles arrived at the ashram, Mia returned to Rishikesh with her brother, John. That's him in the picture there with John Lennon, John Farrow. She finally left India on March 7th to make a film secret ceremony in England with Elizabeth Taylor. That was more than a month before John and George left the ashram. So she was not the primary cause for the Beatles to leave. 
In her 1997 memoir, Mia described the incident with Maharishi. Maharishi said, quote, now we will meditate in my cave, unquote. In the basement of his house, they meditated 20 minutes before a flowered sandalwood scented shrine to Guru Dev. After they stood up, she recalled, quote, I was blinking at his beard when suddenly I became aware of two surprisingly male hairy arms going around me, end quote. She panicked and bolted up the stairs, apologizing as she went. She raced to her sister Prudence, who responded, quote, it's an honor to be touched by a holy man after meditation, a tradition, which by the way, I've never heard of that <laughs> tradition. Uh, but Mia left and was frightened when Maharishi's brahmacharis followed her. Ned Wynn was the son of film actor Keenan Wynn and the grandson of comedic actor Ed Wynn, and he was Mia's childhood friend. After I first learned TM, Ned became my lover. Later, we both served on Maharishi's staff. Ned was known as a, quote, skin boy, end quote. These doorkeepers slash personal assistants spent every waking moment with Maharishi and slept in the room next to him. They carried Maharishi's deer skin and placed it wherever he would sit. At any given time, two or more skin boys took shifts guarding his door, greeting visitors, screening phone calls, and doing Maharishi's bidding on three to four hours sleep each night. Ned said that in the early 70s, quote, I had direct contact with Mia and a very clear and direct conversation with her regarding Maharishi's advances. She told me and Nini White Winquist, that's the woman pictured here, that Maharishi got her alone in his pad in Rishikesh, put his arms around her and tried to get her to lie down with him. She was confused for about three seconds. Then she jumped up, ran out, told her sister. Then she took off for Goa. She said that Maharishi had her followed for weeks by some of his brahmacharis. She was actually scared of them. She said it was clear he wanted her to engage in sex with him. And um, Ned said, I didn't believe her at first because I had the proto Fairfield disease, but clearly she was telling me the truth. After all, she was the chick that married Frank Sinatra, like she didn't know when some guy was making a move. Duh. As he described in his memoir, We Will Always Live in Beverly Hills, quote, the yeah. former Mrs. Frank Sinatra, quote, the former Mrs. Frank Sinatra turns to me, Ned, she says with great patience, don't you think I know when a man, man wants to F me? All right, our next uh, woman we're gonna talk about here is Rosalind. This is Rosalind right here, woman I am circling. And this is Mia Farrell. They have quite a resemblance. Rosalind, a school teacher from Brooklyn in her late twenties. This is Rosalind right here. Rosalind learned TM one year before traveling to India. At that time, there was only one TM initiator in New York City with nowhere to teach. So she volunteered her apartment in Brooklyn as a TM center. Rosalind wanted to take the teacher training course to become a better school teacher, spread TM to the world, and get near Maharishi to absorb his vibrations. In early June, Alexis told John Lennon that Rosalind, whom Maharishi nicknamed Rose, had visited Maharishi's bungalow for private, private counseling and the guru made sexual advances. Alexis accused Maharishi of being a phony sexual predator. One of Maharishi's skin boys gave me this statement. He preferred to remain anonymous. Quote, when Maharishi was presenting a lecture in New York, he invited Rosalind to the course in Rishikesh. Rosalind was unaware of his hidden agenda. She was simply intent on becoming a TM initiator. One night in Rishikesh, Maharishi sent a brahmachari to Rosalind's room at about 9.30 p.m. She told him it was too late and she wanted to go to bed. 
Brahmachari insisted she get dressed and come to Maharishi's house. When she arrived, Maharishi took her downstairs to his basement cave where they meditated together for 20 minutes. Then he took her up to his bedroom. He started hugging her and she could feel his erection. Maharishi sat on his bed and patted the bed for her to come over and get in. Rosalind got the impression that Maharishi did this a lot. She totally freaked out and told him she had to go say goodnight to a friend. She ran out of his house. Maharishi told her to come back later and he would leave the door open. After this, Rosalind no longer felt comfortable on the course because Maharishi was on the make for her. Later, when Maharishi's SRM organization president, Charlie Lutz, heard about sexual allegations contributing to the Beatles' sudden departure, he confronted Maharishi, who replied, quote, but Charlie, I am a lifetime celibate. I don't know anything about sensual desires. During the Beatles' visit to India, one of Maharishi's brahmachari disciples, Raghvendra, left the ashram along with John, George, and the rest of their entourage. Right before Raghvendra left, he revealed to Mike Dolan that both Rosalind, both Rosalind and Mia accused Maharishi of making moves on them. All right, the next person is Gunilla. We're calling her Gunilla. That's not her real name. And she... Uh, the person who wrote about her was Richard Blakely, who's in this picture with John and Paul. He wrote The Secret of the Mantras. His memoir require, recalls his time in Rishikesh while the Beatles were there. <clears throat> At that time, Richard Blakely fell in love with Gunilla. She's sitting next to him. There's Richard. I'm not going to use that pointer anymore because that screwed everything up. But I think you can see my, my, just my arrow. That's him. And this is Gunilla, quote unquote, Gunilla. So at that time, he fell in love with Gunilla. And she was a tall, slender, attractive Swede. She recounted reluctantly that because Maharishi had invited students to see him anytime, she visited him in early mornings whenever the spirit moved her. Always happy to greet her, Maharishi would often send other guests away. Understanding and forgiving, he was like the father she had lost, but that morning was different. The meeting began like any other, but after a long silence, Maharishi asked her to shut the door. Then he asked her if she would do something for him. She agreed, and he asked her to take off her blouse. After a few seconds' hesitation, she removed it and exposed her breasts, rationalizing she should never be ashamed of her body. Maharishi laughed, waved his head side to side, and said, You are so beautiful. Gunilla felt both excited and ashamed. He asked her to move closer, then closer. Then he reached out and jiggled her breasts back and forth. It was so strange and silly that she burst out laughing. Maharishi stopped, leaned back, declared he was tired, removed his shawl, and lay on his back. Then after a while, Gunilla put on her blouse, said goodbye, and left. Richard pitied Maharishi's inept attempts at seducing a woman, yet he worried the guru might try again. Sure enough, during Gunilla's private meeting to become an initiator, Maharishi invited her to come to Rishikesh and stay with him. Gunilla told Richard tearfully, quote, it was so awful. I could see he was embarrassed. I could tell that he was really, what he was really asking me. He didn't have the nerve. He didn't dare say it right out because he's such a coward. Ricard, I don't want to sleep with a fat 50 year old man, even if he's the greatest guru in the world, end quote. In 2021, Richard Blakely confirmed Quote, I am certain that Maharishi groped Rosalind in his bungalow because she told me about it in lurid detail. And he also did the same thing to the woman on the course that to the woman on the course that I was seeing at the time and eventually married Gunilla all the time preaching celibacy to any men on the course who might invade his territory. 
Okay. There was another woman. There were actually four women on the Beatles course that Maharishi made a pass out that we know about. And one of them is my friend who was a 108. She said, I did have an experience in Rishikesh that I never thought anything of at the time, but having heard of so many stories lately, I do sometimes wonder. Maharishi used to see me after the Beatles. He often used to summon me after the evening lecture. No doubt I lacked self-confidence and because I used to meditate all day rather than socialize. He kept asking me to come closer one night when I was alone with him in his bedroom. Well, I refused to go any closer than maybe two feet because I saw him as divine and felt too impure. So finally he said, okay, then we can just sit. So I moved back against a wall and felt this incredible blissful love after which he let me be around him a lot. Okay, Linda Williams Pierce. Okay, I have some very personal experience about this. In Rishikesh, India, right before my TM teacher training course in Rishikesh in early January, 1970, a 22-year-old British woman approached me unexpectedly with a confused, troubled look in her eyes. Linda Williams, later Linda Pierce, said something, said something had happened. She was freaked out and she could not talk about it. Yet she blurted out that Maharishi had hugged her. I said nothing but regarded her with compassion. Then she confessed, but that wasn't all. We did a lot more than that. In the UK Mirror on February 7th, 2008, two days after Maharishi's death, Linda was quoted, quote, he was a brilliant manipulator. I just couldn't see that he was a, a dirty old man. We made love regularly. At one stage, I even thought I was pregnant by him. And I don't think I was the only girl, end quote. In August, 1981, UK journalist David Mertens interviewed Linda the mother of two, claimed Maharishi seduced her while professing to be a monk. Quote, I was a virgin and knew nothing about sex. He said he loved me and that I was the only one. Uh, end quote from Maharishi. You make my life so good, end quote, he told me. When I asked about his celibacy, he said, quote, there are exceptions to every rule, end quote. After serving as a TM leader and teacher from 1967 to 1979, she finally quit, declaring it was all a load of rubbish. We were all completely taken in, end quote. The granddaughter of the Duke of Grafton and student at Bedford College, London University, Linda first met Maharishi in Paris, quote, he was surrounded by lots of pop stars and I was taken in by them. He had a powerful personality. I was totally brainwashed. In January 1969, at the three-month teacher, TM teacher training course in Rishikesh, their sexual union began. Quote, others told me I wasn't his first girl. There was a lot of talk that he'd tried to rape me a pharaoh, end quote. She returned to India for Christmas 1969, and the liaison resumed. By then, she thought it was, quote, wrong and immoral, but, quote, Maharishi just laughed that off, end quote. In 1970, though he tried to persuade her to join his staff, she, she recalled, quote, I just had a desire to stay as far away from him as possible. Linda met her husband, Peter Pierce, a South African at a TM teacher training course in Spain. But Linda recalled, quote, I really thought I was going mad. Maharishi still had a mental hold over me, end quote. But Maharishi told his disciples celibacy was required for spiritual progress. And so Linda believed that she must stay celibate. She could not stand being kissed or touched by her husband. When the couple flew to Switzerland and asked Maharishi what was wrong with Linda, she recalled, quote, she was talking about Maharishi, Quote, all he did was roar with laughter and tell me to go on more courses. Then my husband and I realized it was one big con trick, end quote. Linda's husband, Peter, recalled, quote, when I confronted Marishi about sleeping with my, my, my wife, he just laughed. 
She was having terrible psychological problems because of it, but he said that I should take her to the psychiatrist. He never denied it, end quote. Teresa Olson. Um, Brian? Uh, yes. I want to I want to ask you uh, since she already did a her presentation I'm wondering whether I should say much about her. I think it's um, it's already been covered. So all right. Uh, okay. All right. So I'll just uh, say one small thing about Teresa. I've known Teresa for over fifty years. It was a big shock when she first told me about Marshy exposing his private parts to her. She kept it secret for decades, and she expressed to me she was terrified that if she ever told the secret publicly, she would fear for her life. On the previous video posted here, Teresa finally came out publicly and shared her experience, which happened in the fall of 1969. So I just have a few pictures of Teresa. There she is eating a popsicle in Disneyland with Maharishi. And there she's giving, putting garland over Maharishi. And she's in this picture with her parents. And over here also with her parents. And there she is at Camp Catalina Island. And here a little older, more like a teenager at Lake Arrowhead. And I'll just say one thing that Teresa says, quote, I've carried a stain in my soul ever since that event. And I did my best to hold back and let others move in so that I would be in the background and not bothering Maharishi as he accomplished his mission. I, I think it's probably worth pointing out that Teresa was kind of trapped because her family were profoundly dedicated to Maharishi for, the, for her whole life. Um, and so she felt she couldn't say anything to her parents uh, because it would have a devastating effect on them and because it would seem disloyal to, to the family enterprise which was supporting Maharishi. Uh, so she couldn't, she couldn't be away from Maharishi. Uh, uh, and he was, uh, according to her and other sources, um, he was rather horrible to her uh, for the the rest of the many decades that um, she was forced to be in his presence. Uh, uh, so it was a, it's a dreadful story. Okay, so on to our next and, uh, person. Is it, if I use the mute override. I think we need to emphasize. Oh, that's Rob. Hi, Rob. How you doing, Susan? She, she, yeah, I'm so glad you're here. I've been here all the time last. Oh, cool. uh, she didn't just say he exposed his private parts. He exposed his private parts, placed her hand on his penis, and asked, to, asked her to adjust, meaning I presume, right. presume give me an erection. So just in case anyone has missed that important detail, I, I throw it in there. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so Judith, our brave woman who came out of the closet. And I certainly hope that she can be a role model for any other women who had a similar experience with Maharishi. So here she is winning this award, a very prestigious award for her audio book. Uh, this was for the book robes of silk, feet of clay that she came out with and waited until Maharishi had passed before she came out with it. And uh, she told me, um, quote, from 1970 to 1972, I was involved with the, quote, celibate, unquote, monk, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in an intimate love affair. He told me not to tell anyone. I waited until he passed to write my book, Robe, Robes of Silk, Feet of Clay, 
which tells the story of my travels to India in the hopes of having a deeply spiritual experience, I had a very human one instead. Since 1968, since 1968, I'd been part of a meditating community in Cambridge, Massachusetts while attending university. I attended regular meetings for group meditation at the local center and found that after two years of TM, I had experienced deeply positive changes in my personality. The creator of the TM movement, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, had been spoken of with reverence by the young leaders of the center. It was his goal to spread meditation throughout the world. And I thought that he must be a very special and wise man. Like so many others of my generation, I too wanted to spread love, peace, and harmony in the world. So when I found out I could become a teacher of TM, I jumped at the chance. After graduation, I quickly got a job waitressing to earn the cash I needed for the trip to India in January 1970, a trip that I expected would be a profoundly spiritual experience. Once in Rishikesh, waiting in Marishi's villa for a personal appointment, along with all the other future meditation teachers, I remember thinking that I would soon meet a truly holy man. Maybe he would be something like Jesus, I thought, or at least like one of the apostles. The thought of meeting someone that divine was so exciting. After all, he was a living prophet. I could hardly believe my good fortune. Finally, it was my turn to walk down to the small table and chair placed in the garden in front of Marishi. But then something happened I didn't expect. During my very first meeting alone with him, he started to treat me as though I was somehow special. I was surprised, surprised and thrilled at the same time. This living prophet, my new master, seemed to like me. Yet it wasn't until he started touching me some days later, well, while at the same time telling me not to tell anyone, that I finally understood he was attracted to me as a woman. A healthier reaction to his advances would have been to push him away in anger and disillusionment. But no, I felt chosen. I often think that my religious upbringing may have had a lot to do with my way of reacting. The entire story of our affair is in my book, Robes of Silk, Feet of Clay. So let me just summarize by saying in the beginning, I believed I would be devoted to him for the rest of my life, living publicly as a kind of nun and then secretly as a lover slash wife. Two things changed my mind. Firstly, the realization that he was meeting with other young Western women. And secondly, the insight that I had become completely dependent upon his moods and the way he treated me. Today, I'm infinitely grateful that I had that insight. Had I remained in the TM movement, I would have lived a miserable life. Continuing. Susan, um, Susan, yes. Um, I, I don't know if this is appropriate. The uh, group photo in Rishikesh is so rich in players in this drama. Do you think everyone might like, I mean, Angelic is in there. Right. So we have. In this picture, we have uh, Angelica. You have Hannah there also. We have Hannah, who I'm going to be speaking about in a few minutes. We have Hannah. We have Judith. We have Rob. We have Ashok with and Rob. And you have yourself also. We have Prudence. We have me. And uh, you know so many others. Yes, you down have, in, you have down in front. Here. You have Helga piano up there. Who, who was yes, there. we have Helga right here. Helga was the finance woman. She was yes. Where, where's she was closer to Marishi than really anybody else uh, <laughs> as far as working relationship? Down Somebody in front, else? Susan. Yes. Uh, immediately in front of Marishi. Well, that's Marilyn Jest. All right. Very big, big resemblance to Mia and and to Rosalind. Very much resembling. Yeah, um, but no, we know nothing about you know anything about her relationship except that she was very close to Marshy. Is Connie in there? No. No, Connie wasn't there. He was in 1969. He might be in another uh, one that's coming up. I have a picture yeah, right. of the 1969 course. And you ha have David there also. David Fisk? Yes, there. Where is David? Yes, David Fisk. There David Fisk. 
he was uh, on okay. our course. So uh, we know them all. <laughs> yeah. I, see, do, do, I see Bevan Morris too. Bevan? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Devendra and, and uh, Bevan and all the others. And, David Fisk and, is my teacher. Rindy yeah. Schwartz is on the left. Rindy, side. Rindy is here. There's, there's yeah. Rindy right there. And the, up there, you have a Swedish uh, uh, pad. It's his name. Uh, uh, he was also around during that course, but I don't know his last name. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of Swedish people here. Uh, there. Yeah, there, we had a lot of Swedish people on that course. Yeah. yeah. And and there's they Jeffrey are, Baker. I spoke about yeah. him earlier. Yeah, <laughs> and there you have uh, 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 Peggy. Peggy uh, Schnell. Ah, uh, yes, Peggy, Peggy, yeah. Peggy, Peggy, Peggy. Yeah, no, yeah there. Right oh, there you Prudence. have this one. She's uh, right this. next to Prudence, who's it? Peggy. This, this is Peggy. And Carol yes. Hamby. Carol Hamby, very close to Marcy. Very, very close to Marcy. Always, Nini, we talked always. about Nini a minute, a few minutes ago. Nini White, and this one, this one, everyone would notice because he was very long time in in Salisbury. Who? Yeah, the one that I'm pointing at. Can you see? No, we don't see your pointer. You'd have to. <laughs> uh, 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 you'd have uh, to uh, 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 describe where that person is. Yeah, take. Uh, uh, you, you see. Um, uh, beside on the right side of of uh, Gurudev is is that uh, uh, Indian uh, fellow that was making the Shankar Law, Shankar yeah. Law. Yeah, and then you move straight away to the right. There's a, 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 a man there, and then the next man is standing with folded hands behind the Swedish lady, uh, above the Swedish lady there. With long hair, he was very much in Salisbury during our time. No, move down. Are you down. talking about Bob Down? No, 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 no. Down, down. Mm -hmm. Go down. That's Bob and Down in the back row. That, that. Yeah, oh, that's no. Bob Down. Yeah, but uh, you talking this, about that one? Yeah. Yes. You, um, I know his his name. All right. Um, so I'm continuing with what Judith is saying. Susan Shamsky accurately uses the word convoluted to describe all of the theories, stories, and gossip surrounding the Beatles' departure from Rishikesh. There is a reason it's all such a mess. Personal and organizational agendas. The TM movement, for example, is highly protective of their guru's image as a celibate monk and has thousands of active devo devotees who comment, compose, and describe the, quote, truth, unquote, the way they want the rest of the world to see it. I know because I have been called both schizophrenic and mentally out of balance by TM leadership and devotees since I released the first edition of my book in 2010. The continued attempts to discredit these women. Yes, people are still arguing about what really happened during the Beatles course, who have done nothing more than tell some friends or acquaintances about what happened to them at Marshy's Villa in Rishikesh seems so out of date. Isn't it time to me too this 50-year-old past once and for all? I feel that there is only one person to blame for the Beatles leaving Rishikesh so abruptly, and that is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi himself. I would really agree on, on that, and that would be a, a, an honor if this also could be a film later on, because this, this would really bring out the whole spectra of of the scam that he was doing. Yeah. We're, we're listening to, the, the person speaking is Connie Larson, who was uh, Marsh's secretary and Deerskin carrier uh, for a number of years. Okay, so uh, Rob was in India in 1969 and 1970, and he said, quote, Judith was in India, the second course I was on. I was then the skin carrier with a, young Indian guy named Ashok. Every night after business was done and everyone had gone to bed, Marshi would have Ashok and me go get Judith so she could quote, read poetry, unquote, to Maharishi before bed. Ashok and I called her the quote, poetry girl, end quote. 
uh, this is a, more quote, quotes from Rob. He would also have her dress up in fancy saris and paint her face. I was in a very strange state of mind about this. Ashok, the Indian boy with whom I was close, became contemptuous about Marishi, but I somehow couldn't let the facts into my conscious mind. But I do remember how Ashok and I used to joke about the poetry girl in a ribald way that implied that more than poetry had been was being read. I never talked with Judith about this, but when I came to know what was going on with Belinda, quote Belinda, that's not a real name. I knew the same thing must have been true with Judith, which Belinda confirmed. I was so naive that I tried to block out the obvious. Rob declared, quote, my true believer mentality would not permit me to deduce what otherwise would have seemed obvious. Okay, so I'm just gonna comment about Judith. I was right there. If you, you can see me in this picture, actually, here I am, there's me. And I was right there with Judith during the course, not only during the course, but after the course, we stayed for several months afterwards. In fact, we stayed all the way till June. The course ended in April and there was only a very small handful of people. And we traveled with Marishi, we traveled with him to Delhi, to Bangalore. And uh, I'll tell you, Marishi would put us in one hotel and put Judith in the hotel with him. You know, there's a red flag right there. And um, uh, we couldn't understand why Marishi put us in a different hotel. And he was always with her late at night, giving her so much attention. Uh, we were jealous of her at the time because, you know, we didn't know any better. We certainly didn't suspect he was having a love affair with her, you know, so. Very strange. Anyway, she was so beautiful, so radiant, and now she would just dress her up like a little doll, you know, like he did with all his, his various women. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about transcendental meditation in a moment. What, right. I, I, what I just wanted to do was just, just for fun to find out a little bit about who you are and where you came from. A very simple, natural man. <laughs> <laughs> and you have been a, a monk all of your life. Uh, yeah. And you're a lifelong... And I am very old in every country by now. There's nothing new about me in any country. And you're a lifelong celibate, is that right? Uh, yes, I'm a life celibate. Uh, As a monk. All right, the next one we're going to talk about, I call her Elsa. And according to Connie, she was in Rishikesh in 1969 and must have started there. And she was in Rishikesh in 1970, which is right here we are with Elsa. There's Judith, there's me. <clears throat> and um, there's Sachin on, by the way, and Jerry. <clears throat> so according to Connie, uh, he, she also was there when Connie was a skin boy in, in Salisbury. And what years were you skin boy in Salisbury, Connie? Connie, could you unmute yourself and just tell us what years you were a skin boy in Salisbury? I unmute myself yes. now. Yeah. I, yes, you I, are now I, unmuted. I was there in different periods, you see, because I was a, a quite a famous actor in my country, and I had to go there for for about three or four or five or six months, and then I was called for different duties, and it started already, in fact, when I went to uh, to Yuji uh, uh, the first time, and then uh, uh, I was taken down to. Uh, to uh, uh, then Rishikesh, no, then then to, uh, to uh, Salisburg, and there I was uh, right. uh, doing duties, uh, either some uh, some, either as a, a boy taking care of all the boxes for registrating the uh, be, behind them in the Sonnenberg for registrate all the teachers, and when he was testing me, as Johnny Gray always said, 
he was on duty during that time. Then, then, then I he tested me and tested me and tested my loyalty and and also my naivety. You see, and then finally he he chose me later to become his skin boy, and that was during. Uh, finally, uh, 1973, I think, huh? and then I right. was, yeah, and then I was there, yeah, and I was chosen uh, together with uh, Clifford McGuire uh, to to arrange this this uh, monastery group. Uh, uh, that meant that all the young uh, uh, boys around her she should be. Uh, uh, moved into a, a, a celibacy group called called the M group, and uh, mm. I was the one that was going to arrange that together with Mr. McGuire. Uh, as uh, still being his his private secretary, I was almost always locked up in the room since I had the night duty as his masseur, and uh, also uh, taking care of the keys and where to go and whom to go and leave the keys. That I had to do uh, every morning when I had given his uh, massage uh, because he was always sitting all the day, so he needed that. Right. And, yeah. And, so and, we had heard about that when you when you gave your presentation. Uh, yeah. So Connie uh, is just telling us that uh, that this woman that we're calling Elsa, that she was always around. She was there in '69. Yeah. She was again there in Salisbury when he was a uh, skin boy there. Yeah. And that uh, that not only in uh, 69, but also on Judith's TTC in 1970 and years later, first in Salisbury with Connie at the door. And then finally, Marcy dismissed her. I think she was sent, he, Connie thinks that she was sent back to Germany by the crazy whims people that Marcy had around Salisbury. So uh, the, here the, you see the, the picture. The Elsa, uh, the Elsa is in fact, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, not her name. Uh, there is another. No, name. we're not using her name. We're not going to mm -hmm. say her name here. Mm -hmm. We don't have Good. permission for her from her. So here you see her in Bangalore. When remember, I said that we stayed. A few of yes. us, handful of people, stayed afterwards. We went down to Bangalore with Marshi, and there she was again. And there's <laughs> me. There's Nini. There is Ram Rao, who was the man who first. The first man that Maharishi initiated, ever initiated into TM. And he was the man who named him, named Mahesh Maharishi. Mm -hmm. And we went and uh, he invited us to his home and we were all given gifts and he was very, very nice to us. And anyway, that's Ram Ram. And he came, he's in the Los Angeles pictures with Teresa as well. So anyway. Uh, she's pictured here, and uh, it's really. Is there evidence of Elsa being aligned with Marchi? We'd have to ask Connie because he's the one that tells us that she was one of the women. Uh, oh, yeah, it was always there. Okay, so she was one of the. One of the women. Of course, he was. There's no doubt about that. And that would be, quote, Belinda. This was the name that was given by Judith, so we're sticking with that name. Uh, so in the spring of 1971, at the end of the teacher training course in Mallorca, Spain, Marshy asked Belinda, a young, pretty, shapely woman with long, wavy, blonde hair, to stay in Europe. She agreed without knowing what he had in mind. Marshy sent Belinda and her brother and several others to England to give TM introductory lectures. Marshy then asked them to return to Spain. They stayed a short while, then Belinda's brother returned to the United States. Several of Marshy's staff, including Belinda and Maharishi, were on an outing in a car. They stopped for lunch. Belinda didn't go into the restaurant and neither did Maharishi. He was talking to her in the car, and by the look he was giving her, it was obvious to her what he wanted. She, she fell under his spell, and the affair began. At Marshy's bidding, the skin boys ordered, quote, 30 of the finest saris from India 
for Belinda. Late at night after his visitors had dispersed or early morning before the rush began, Belinda would be summoned. Donning a sari and makeup, she would, quote, recite poetry or, quote, read the mail for a couple of hours. The skin boy would be dismissed to, quote, go and rest or to wait outside the door. Rob Gordon, the first Westerner that Marsha initiated as a brahmachari, celibate monk, said, quote, I did not get sent to bed. I had to wait outside the door until Belinda left. Then she would appear rumpled and smeared. I also watched her mental state deteriorate. Clearly something bad was going on. Several of Marshy's skin boys personally revealed to me details of this liaison. Casey Coleman, he was one of the skin boys, um, he told me, quote, at one point I had the job of being Marshy's doorkeeper. I do not remember how many times, but something like four or five. The last thing at night or early morning at 2 a.m. when everyone was gone and it was just me and him, he would tell me to get Belinda to do the mail. She would be sleeping and would come with me. Then the two of us would go into the room to do the mail. But after a few minutes, Marshy would tell me to go and rest, which I was very happy to do. The thought of them having sex never entered my mind. I never talked to Belinda about it. I only heard about it secondhand from Ned, Rob, and Billy. But then thinking back on it, I wonder why I couldn't have seen the obvious. Ned, Rob, and Billy being Marsh's secretaries. Yes, Marsh's skin boy secretaries. Yeah. No question. Yeah, I, I, hate it. I don't want to interrupt you. But at this time, Ned was not a skin boy. There were only two skin boys, Casey and myself. And during this mm -hmm. period of time, one of us was on the door. There were other helping people around, but we were the skin boys at that time. And this was in Mallorca. Correct. Yes. All right. So Casey also said, quote, but here's something also interesting. Right at this time, Marishi got all fired up that women should not cook for him, that women cooking for him or even being in his kitchen was having some negative effect on him. So I think he was trying to find the reason for the desire showing up in him. Okay, so skin boy, B Billy Clayton, he said this to me. <clears throat> Marshy was spending a lot of time with Belinda. She spent a couple hours every morning in his room, quote, reading him his mail. Though sometimes there wasn't any mail or very little. Marshy was buying clothes for her and suggesting how she should dress. Once when a man who had been her boyfriend came to visit the course, a wealthy guy who came to donate money, Marishi was very grumpy and after taking the gift, dismissed the man abruptly. While it was going on, Judith and Belinda's best friend, June, approached Belinda. They saw what was happening and told Belinda that she would be just one of numerous women that Marishi had already had. This caused Belinda to want to escape. Marishi gave Belinda a lot of money, all in Spanish pesetas, in hopes of keeping her from leaving. Belinda said Jerry Jarvis delivered the package of money to her. Belinda said, quote, he was really pissed at having to do it. In other words, Jerry. Jerry was very pissed at having to deliver that money. Rob said, quote, finally she snapped and fled from Marshy, who was looking for her. He left for Switzerland to hide out with the Australian girls, Bev and Fran, who were working there at the time. And there, Belinda called her brother at the TM Center in the U.S. She was crying, explaining some details of the affair with Maharishi. When Maharishi found out that she'd left, he was beside himself. He spent hours on the phone trying to coax her back. Skin boy Ned said, quote, Rob and I were doorkeepers. Yes, we saw her go in late at night. June also went in late at night, but she never got the opportunity to tell anyone anything before the plane went down. I never put together the fact that Belinda went in at night with anything sexual. I was totally blind to it. Now that I put it all together, Belinda and Judith both would wander out of Marcia's rooms at around 4.30 or 5.30 a.m. on different courses, of course. What the hell were they doing up all night? reading to him, of course, and taking dictation. Uh, Belinda said that one night while leaving Marshy's room, 
Maharishi's Anglo-Indian Brahmachari Philip Williams, known as Devendra. We saw him in that picture uh, from 1970 Rishikesh saw her leaving devendra saw her leaving and shook his head suspecting what was happening this would explain why he went back to india before marishi left for switzerland ned said quote i was on at least three courses in Majorca in january 1971 until the summer of 72 when belinda left marishi was like a pimply faced soul sick geek the whole floor was somber everyone was silent looking around worried anxious Belinda is gone. Where is Belinda? Where is Belinda? Somebody will get her. Yes, not here, but where she is. Ned said, I had no idea where she was. When Marcia made these plaintive whines about her, we would look at each other, uh, look at each of us. Oh, he would look at each of us as if we could produce her out of a hat or as if we had possibly conspired to help her. I did not, but some others may have had the guts to help her. I never knew that she was going. She was afraid to tell me, she said later, because she didn't know how deeply I was into the whole thing and that I might tell Marishi she was leaving and he would try and prevent her. Remember, Marishi tried to get some of his monks to bring me a pharaoh back. They followed her practically to Goa. Once, once Marishi located Belinda, he phoned her repeatedly imploring her to return to Mallorca, even shouting, but to no avail. Uh, once Marishi located Belinda, he phoned her, phoned her repeatedly, imploring her to return to Mallorca, even shouting, but to no avail. Rob recalled that Marishi was acting like an angst-ridden adolescent, trying frantically to get her back. Rob said, quote, the TM movement came to a halt while she spent hours on the phone like a heartbroken teenager. Rob said, my faith in Marishi's supposed perfection dissipated when he got sexually involved with Belinda. Then when she left him and went to hide out in Switzerland, I observed him reduced to the status of a quivering out adolescent. Marishi was angry with, with Belinda's best friend, June, when he found that she had helped Belinda escape by giving her money and driving her to the airport. All right, now this is a quote from Belinda. The thing I find interesting about this whole discussion are the allegations that Judith and I might be lying. Actually, if you read the stories carefully, what the men knew is all that they should have known. They got me from my room. Marshy asked for me. I have not told any story yet. I have no incentive to lie. In fact, my brother and his wife were just coming to Spain to join Mahar the Maharishi insiders when I decided to run away. I had to call them and tell them what had happened and why I needed to leave. June, who helped me leave the course, I'm, I'm continuing, this is Belinda speaking. June, who helped me to leave the course, was sent home when Marishi found out she gave me money to leave and drove me to the airport. She later died in a plane crash with Joe Clark when they were looking for property for the university. The phone calls from Marishi to me in Switzerland were overheard by a number of people I pose this question to Marishi, <clears throat> quote, how can a man around whom women must not show an inch of skin for whom celibacy is such a core espoused value fall into such a pit? So, so um, also, also, I just want to mention, we've now yeah. outed June as April Clement since she is no longer with us. So June yeah. is what, I just want everyone to know that June is April Clements. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, some, yeah. Uh, I, I was just being true. overcautious because someone had mentioned, you know, what about her family and so on. I was just saying that we've already outed this issue on a previous Zoom. Right. So. Oh, on a previous Zoom. Okay. Okay. All right. Then we know who June is. All right, so um, someone asked Belinda, how did Marishi answer this question? Do you feel that Marishi ever did any real soul searching over his behavior? And Belinda responded, yes, he did earlier. A young man died on our course in Mallorca. I recall that he was mentally challenged and on the course with his mother. One morning he was found dead down on the rocks near the ocean. Marishi was distraught and told me that he thought this happened because of his karma and because of his wrong conduct. In the phone call, he was 
just upset and begging me to return. So June was Belinda's best friend. I always saw them together. Uh, June knew about Belinda's affair with Marshy. In addition, Marshy touched June inappropriately. He stuck his hand down her blouse and grabbed her breasts. Then he blamed her for it and complained that she should not wear such low cut blouses. She's not in this picture, by the way. This is just a picture of people in Mallorca, which is where it happened. And uh, we know this because June told you. No, uh, not me. Uh, we know this because. Uh, because she told me. All uh, right. Right. June, that's right. April getting groped blew the whole thing up. Once she right. got groped, she had heard that Judith wasn't sexually involved with Maharishi, but was as was common with so many of us, she kind of dismissed the story. But when he actually groped her in such a hungry, predatory way, then it it was then that she went to Judith and asked her what was going on. Then I told her the same thing appeared to be going on with Belinda. The two of them conferred and that blew the whole thing up and led to Belinda uh, being spirited away to Palma de Orca by, by April. Right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, so yeah, Rob has talked to Belinda quite a bit himself and met her, you know, personally. So he definitely is the authority on this. So Ned Wynn, uh, we talked about him a little bit before. He's one of the skin boys at a certain time. In the early 1970s, Mia Farrow revealed to Ned Wynn her story of Marcy's inappropriate behavior. Judith Bork and Belinda who both had liaisons with Marishi, visited said Ned, visited Ned in Santa Monica in the early 1970s. Ned recalled, quote, these, girl these girls told me, and Jane Go, my former wife, uh, these stories personally. All the conversations with Judith, who stayed with Jane and me for a week in Santa Monica, and Belinda, who lived in Santa Monica when she was first married to a nice guy named Tim, whom she later divorced, took place in our apartment on 19th Street in Santa Monica sometime in the early 70s. And by the way, that, can, that's can, not Jane. Can, Jane, that picture is not of Jane. <laughs> can you uh, repeat that for us, Susan? Uh, um, Ned had a conversation with which women? Uh, um, with, who? With Judith, okay. Uh, it was Judith, Judith Bork, and Belinda. Judith okay, and so they Belinda. Came, they came to Santa Monica, and they stayed for them, uh, stayed with Jane and Ned for a week in Santa Monica. And they told him, they told Ned exactly what? Yeah, so this is the bare bones of what I know personally from both Belinda and Judith. This is, I'm quoting Ned Wynn right now. This uh, email was originally written uh, to Rob, so it may be a bit raw and flippant for you, but we, Rob Casey and I, are way past being amazed at this. I've known this for 30 years now. These girls told me, and Jane Go, my former wife, these stories personally. Belinda called us up and made it a point to come to our house and tell us this story. She was angry about it. She felt that she had been taken advantage of by Marishi because of his power and aura he had. Once the blinders were off, she felt abused and cheated as if she had been effed while in a stupor. Judith spent a week at our house. It was intimate. I have absolutely no reason to doubt them. Though when I was in your shoes, I doubted Mia Farrow, who told me about Marishi's overt sexual passes at her I thought she was mistaken. I no longer believe this stuff is untrue. These things also happened, I believe, but have no firsthand knowledge with, with June and a South American woman who was around before we were. There are obviously a number of girls that he screwed that we know nothing about. 
and it went on for at least 20 years. Someone besides me has got to know this. Jerry, for one, the Australian girls, Deb and Fran, Devendra knew, Billy had to know. I'm continuing to quote Ned here. The girls are very explicit. There was no coy innuendo. They were forthright and anxious to tell it as it was definitely an unburdening to the only two people they apparently thought would give them a fair hearing and not be dismissive, et cetera. They did not sound like women who were making anything up or embellishing on a look they got or something. There was no doubting any of the substance of what they told me. These girls were not rumor mongering or trying to self aggrandize. They both had completely different points of view on Maharishi. As I said in a previous email, Belinda despised him. Judith loved him. They both effed him. I made sure to ask, did they actually have complete sex? They said, yes. So it was less than thrilling to Belinda. One of the things that amazed me was the distaste with which Belinda referred to her sex with Maharishi. She thought it was terrible. He was a shitty lover, of course, and she hated it, but did it anyway. As for Judith, she was actually, she told me, in love with Maharishi, actually infatuated love with him. So she overlooked the bad sex. Maharishi is one of the most immoral effers I've ever known. He misuses his power in shockingly banal ways, kind of like an aging CEO with his secretaries. The guy has absolutely no style, no class. He's the classic backward and reactionary, sexually repressed, greedy, hypocritical, and a bald-faced liar. Ned didn't mince any words. Okay. The next one yes, is... Ned, Ned, Ned personally told me all of that as well. Yes. Yes, for sure. Thank, thanks, yes. Rob. Yeah. Yeah. Ned can confirm all of this. This whole discussion was going on with Ned. We were on a listserv. It was called the Yogi Bogey Busters group. It was a Yahoo group. And uh, several of us were on this discussion. And, and Belinda actually even was part of it. So uh, that's where a lot of this information sort of got out and now we're making it quite public. Okay, so this one, I just found out about it because Teresa told us about it. I'm called her cosmic girl. And this was in Fuji in June of 72. Uh, Satyanan and Teresa were there and cosmic girl went in to see Marishi. Two minutes later, she walked out. Satyanan said, that's the shortest meeting I've ever heard of. And recently, Cosmic Girl confided to Teresa that she had been propositioned and that she turned Marishi down. She went out and created businesses. She's very adept in the business world. Marishi used to ex exclaim about her experiences of cosmic consciousness. She was a very high consciousness disciple. Uh, in 2011, Teresa said the head of the TM organization, I have no idea who she's referring to, but she said the head of the TM organization asked Cosmic Girl to call Teresa and tell her that Maharishi had slept with 16 people. Cosmic Girl offered Teresa to teach her an advanced course at a wonderful discount for $10,000. So that's that short story. The rest of these stories are can, very short. You can't just to get this clear uh, uh, this you're calling cosmic girl she was asked by whoever was the current head of the tm organization to tell teresa that marshy had sex with 16 women yeah yeah that's what teresa said and and we we know the name of this cosmic girl and I know her name, she, yes. And she's she's known to many people. She is known, yes. yes. In fact, okay. Teresa really revealed it. She revealed it because she said her initials on the on the previous uh right. on the previous uh, Zoom. Yeah. Susan, Susan, I think it's important yes. to know the context of how that happened, and Teresa isn't with us. But as I've understood yeah. the story to be, there was an interaction going on with Teresa and said leader. And Teresa was talking about what had happened to her. 
And then the leader, the attitude was, what happened to you? Well, you know, in other words, instead of answering her directly, he sent someone to tell her, look, you're not, you're not special. There were 16. And some leader, oh my the, gosh. With the leader, we know who she's talking about, right? We know who that is. But he wasn't just volunteering this information to Teresa for no reason. It was in reply to her allegations. He wanted her to feel like she was unimportant because she was one of so many. That was the whole spirit of the response. That's Should so I come in there. <laughs> yes. so, can... Regarding the Teresa, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was around uh, 73, 74, 75. Uh, partly his secretary, and he always talked bad about uh, Teresa. Teresa was useless, uh, and uh, she back. Uh, uh, she was then the uh, World Plan News, uh, the uh, editor, and whatever she was. And he always said that she's useless to me. This mm. is the, the truth. How it's sad. It. It's very sad. Very but that's sad. the truth. He did that with many of the women. Yeah, if I can right. just in, in, interrupt you there, the the implication here uh, w w with this cosmic girl carrying this message, um, and we assume it's it's all true, is that the TM organization is uh, tacitly admitting that all of this took place, uh, which is. Astonishing, and it is astonishing. And the has a number of implications which we don't have to go into right now. Uh, but I, I just, I, I'm just fl flagging it as uh, as important. It is yes. extremely important. I, I just it's amazing. And thank you, Delana, for uh, explaining it. Wow. Okay, our next person is, um, we call her Geraldine. And uh, it was in uh, California, in Lake Tahoe in 1972. Uh, skin boy Billy tried to open Marishi's bedroom door to announce an urgent overseas phone call, but the door was un uncharacteristically bolted from inside and Marishi unexpectedly did not respond. Finally, a dozen people waiting in his ante room witnessed Geraldine, a female 108, who was his nightly visitor, finally answer the door. Around the same time, Geraldine's husband became angry and suspicious and refused to return to the estate. His view during nighttime, she just went in and out as she wanted. Marshy never said no to any of her requests. She was always the favorite of Marshy. He arranged all the time that the husband should be out of the way all the time. Several skin boys and girlfriends reported similar incidents during our time in San Ellisburg. Sometimes girlfriends mistakenly rang the call buzzard. One skin boy told me that he walked in on Marishi lying on his bed, the girlfriend nearby, and a feeling of whoops in the air. I'm sorry, I don't remember which skin boy that was, but um, maybe it was Rob. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, next. Dr. Jesse has, um, has given permission for us to talk about her. Uh, but she was not sure about Marishi's intentions towards her, but she expressed that she felt like she was being groomed, quote unquote. This was a teacher training in Lantia in the fall of 72. She said, I was alone in the lecture hall. Marishi came in alone. I was shocked because he usually had a skin boy with him, but he came in alone. I gave him some coral to bless. He told me he felt I was very beautiful at the time I thought, that's sweet. Several weeks later, it was time for Jessie to receive the mantras as a new TM teacher. She said, quote, I went to a room with a sheet dividing the room. I was told to go behind the sheet to get final teacher instruction for Marishi. I went on my knees in front of him to bow down to his feet for the usual Indian respect for her elders. He grabbed my arm and pulled me up close to his body and said something like, you don't have to do that. I'm just like you. It was uncomfortably close, right next to his body. Then we heard voices behind the sheet as other people entered the room, and he stopped and finally finished the final instructions and gave me the mantras to use. The other incidents were three years later in Switzerland on the six-month course. 
There were several occasions when she, when uh, Jesse was walking alone in the hallway. Marcy appeared and he would stop and just stand there and look me up and down. It was really quite uncomfortable. Not what uh, she would expect out of her enlightened master. On that course, she said, he called on me a lot to speak about my experiences. And then uh, she continues, she said, he invited me to stay for Vedic studies course and eventually he invited me to his room. I felt weird about it, especially when um, she thought about the other encounters. I didn't go to his room, I rebuffed him and that whole thing shifted. He said, don't stay for Vedic studies. These incidents felt weird to me. Every time they felt off. I felt these were signals from him for me to be closer to him. Okay, uh, now here's another story. This is from a former member of the Purusha program. Quote, it started like this. I was sitting after a retreat and we were talking about the integrity of gurus or lack thereof. And I was saying that at least I was confident that my former guru, Maharishi, was clean as far as sex goes. One woman challenged me and said that she knew of a woman who could tell a different story. I asked her to tell me who that woman was. She said she could not, as that woman certainly did not want anyone to know a thing about it. I said, please, can you contact that woman and ask her if she would talk to me? As this would be very important for me to know, having spent so many years with the assumption that my guru was clean that way. She said she would call that woman and ask her. After about an hour, a woman whom I had known well and who had known very well about my involvement with Marishi and my respect and love for him came up to me and said, quote, I heard that you wanted to talk to me, unquote. I understood that this was the woman who had some experience with Marishi. I was very surprised because she never told me that she knew Marishi. She was among a group of young college students that went to hear Marishi when he came to Australia in the late 60s. It is possible that this is before the Beatles were involved. I don't know. Whoops. Um, anyway, at one point, Marishi was flying somewhere with Devendra to a different town, and he asked a few of them, all young girls, to join him, which they did happily. He had given his talk there and flew back with them in the plane. They then accompanied him to the hotel. At one point, he turned to the woman and told her, come, I'll give you my love. She was not sure what it meant, but she did not respond. She thought, no, it cannot be what I think it is. And she let it slide, dismissing any thoughts about it. Although she did not consider, it, consider herself a disciple of Marshi, she went to hear him talk a year later. Again, after the lecture, he invited her to come with him and repeated his same enigmatic offer. She said she was curious what he meant and accompanied him to his room. She said he hugged her and kissed her and that her thought at the time was that he did not know anything about women and was very inexperienced. She said she felt very flattered. She was 19 or so and confused. And she asked him, but are you not a monk? And he let go and smiled and said, yes, I am a monk. However, she was very careful to say, one, that nothing actually transpired. That is, she never went to bed with him. Two, he was very gentle. He did not try to force her into anything. She described his room with quite some detail, and I could satisfy myself that at least she was in his bedroom with the puja set and all that. I asked her why she wanted to be so secretive about it. She said that she did not want to make people who innocently following who are innocently following him disillusioned about him. She said that she would have never told me anything about it had I not asked for it in a way that I did. I'm not 100% sure what her motivations for hiding the story are. Maybe there's more to it than she was willing to say. I remember people telling me this phrase, oh, this is me speaking. This is not this guy. I personally, Susan, remember people telling me this phrase of Marishi's, I will give you my love being described to me on several occasions. I think he used that as a pickup line. But I asked Judith and she doesn't remember him saying it to her. So. 
That was that. Okay. Next, Madeline. Madeline is, uh, this is uh, from Connie. Uh, she was a very outgoing intelligence officer to Effervescent 108 that I knew very well. And Connie gave the key to Marcy's door on a nightly basis. And that's really all I have to say about her. At what, at what time? This was in oh. Salisbury. No, I mean, at what time of night? Yeah. Oh, we have to ask Connie. Yeah, usually after that I had made, he gave him my massage, and that was maybe around 3.30 or 4. Then, then he told me that you have to go to this room or that room. And this is what I did, because I, I thought that the penny hadn't dropped, you see, so I just went there, but there, they were sitting dressed in all these stories and flower in the hair and whatever. And and uh, Madeline, as you see here, was one of them. So uh, we're talking 3.30 a.m. or 4 a.m.? Night time, of course. Always mm -hmm. night time. Since I was locked up at this uh, night, uh, night skin boy, so you were regularly taking it, uh, the key and delivering it to various women yes, at 3.30 a.m. Yeah. or 4 a.m. Yeah, in the morning. Morning. Yeah. And Connie also had Thanks. mentioned to me that, he, that at the time he wondered, well, why are not giving it to John Gray, who was yeah. his co-skin uh, yeah. boy? The other skin boy was working at the same time with him. And yes. you know why am I giving it to this woman instead of John Gray? He couldn't understand. You know, and, and, and and John Gray never commented on it though during the time that it uh, was going on. And Connie, uh, the, these women were living. It, maybe we can go back to the previous picture of Salisburg. These women were living in the Sonnenberg or the Kulm or. Some of them, both in Kulm and some of them in Sonnenberg, because Marie so, had a flat there. You can see on the picture. Can you see where I'm pointing at? This is this is the Kulm. Yeah, this is the Kulm. And this is this this is a Sonnenberg. Sonnenberg, yeah, and, that I'm and, circling. And here Marie was living, and and she uh, was living here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was he had his flat also here when he used the Sonnenberg women. Oh, he had a place so, in Sonnenberg as well. Yes. yes. So uh, I, I just to, um, to get things clear in my mind, Marshy had two apartments, one yes. in the Kulm, mm -hmm. which is the building in front, mm -hmm. and one in Sonnenberg, yes. which is the building behind. Oh, and my God. Uh, and you were required to... Uh, uh, carry the key uh, across the bridge sometimes um, the bridge. To, to go to, to go and uh, give the, deliver the key to women who might be in the other building, or sometimes they might be in the same building because Marcia was using the the apartment in the in the same building. So the whole thing the, the whole thing was kind of uh, well organized. And, very, very well organized, I would say. <laughs> and uh, Connie, how many w women were you delivering keys to uh, at the same, uh, in the same era or in the same months or weeks? Yeah, yeah. Not mon months or weeks, because this was going on on a, on a longer scale. There were at least two, two in the, in Kulm. And there was a, at least two in in um, in Sonnenberg, and also Max Fischer, and uh, they were living there also. Uh, uh, Max Fischer and Rose Fischer, and uh, uh, one time I I happened uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to stay behind because I didn't want to go follow him. 
to Vittel, to a special course there, and uh, I made myself free uh, on, on request of Max Fischer. And at that specific time, uh, I somehow, uh, uh, they were talking very badly about their situation, uh, Max and Rosie. Uh, in in Salisbury, because Marishi had started to to uh, to put Max a little uh, cool cool the relation down with him, and then finally uh, somehow I mentioned that uh, uh, yeah, but uh, why I didn't want to go because I did I didn't feel good about the whole thing, and uh, then uh, then uh, uh, Max Fisher's wife. Uh, uh, really understood this. So, so they must have been suspecting these things, Max Fisher and, and Rosie, because when I then said that there, there are so many things with the girls happening there, and I don't, and I foresay myself, then, and then she, uh, she um, Rosie, put her fingers into the uh, throat and say, I just want to vomit. That was her response. Sure. So they were and, on to it. Wow. These, they were on to it, these two. And therefore, of course, wow. Marishi, they always wanted to go back to England, you see. And, and Marishi wanted to get rid of them silently because he was a, a very important person in the story of, of, uh, of Marishi because he was a professor or whatever he was. He was a very uh, well, well behaved person then. And uh, when Rosie gets that uh, 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 some sort of knowledge from me, she uh, uh, she was almost throwing up of disgust. Uh, and then finally they had to leave. And for the record, uh, uh, Marshy's apartment was on the left hand in the corn, the building in front. Marsh's apartment was on the left hand side yes, yes. on the third floor mm -hmm. uh, on the left hand side on the third floor the, uh, along there and uh, the apartment of one of the other women that we have been discussing was on the right hand side of the same floor mm -hmm. uh, along there yeah and, I do, yeah uh, that's my my memory but it could also have been on the uh, next floor though but anyhow she could come and go at right. any time right at any time day, day or night and then uh, wh where was marsh's apartment in the sonnenberg up here uh on the on the fourth floor no 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 either it was on the on the second but as i recall it it was here and and then it, it either we, was, we, we can't see your pointer, so no, but you maybe. are there. You are there. Either uh, stay there with the pointer. Either um, stay, go up again, and where you had the pointer there. Either he was uh, living on the upper, or uh, Max Fischer was on the under, or vice versa. So Marsh's apartment was on the front of the building. Yes, on the fourth, on the third or fourth or fifth floor. Yes. Okay. Madeline, let's just go on to Alicia. So Alicia. So there was a man from Fairfield who told Ter Teresa about Alicia. It was a very kind soul. She was about five feet tall with black hair and brownish skin. And she would be called very late at night on a regular basis to go read the mail to Maharishi. This was in Switzerland. So we have yet to, to contact Alicia. Right. But, so okay, then... So, yeah, so just, just, to, just to get it clear from an evidentiary point of view, is that right. recently a man showed up on Teresa's doorstep and told her about this particular woman whom we all know, 
uh, and that she was she was one of those who was regularly brought to Moshe's room. Um, but that's that's all the evidence we have, and we, we're planning to contact her and ask her for her story. Yeah. Leslie was a striking blonde 108 from 1974. She reported that on at least one occasion, Maharishi had her sit in front of his couch and he stroked her hair. We don't know any more than that or if it went any further, but it does seem like a very strange thing for a supposedly celibate brahmachari to do. And then we have... Um, this is from a businessman on the East Coast, and this is a quote from him. I have a friend in this area whose wife told my wife and me a story recently. She said her initiator, an English woman with whom she was very close over a period of years, was with Marishi in the early days and was acting as a personal assistant to him. She helped him with his personal things in his room, etc., Marshi had her massage him and then asked her to massage him in a sexual way. I don't know more details since at the time we were having dinner in a restaurant, she didn't want to talk more about it. She made it abundantly clear that she was positive that Marshi got or attempted to get sexual with this woman and that she had the utmost confidence that her initiator, who was also a friend, told her the truth. That's all we know about that. But it's the fact that it was early 1960s, I think, is interesting, long ago. And then we have Roberta. And uh, we call her Roberta. That's not her real name. And we suspect that she was his lover from the early to mid-70s mid and onwards. And Judith and I both suspect that it would be impossible for Roberta to not be one of the women because she was with Marishi late at night for last at night for years. And because he did the routine spoiling of her with the best saris, jewelry, and special privileges, such as a separate luxury dining room with fancy linens, porcelain, cutlery, etc. Plus, due to the familiarity that I witnessed between her and Marishi and the kind of emotions, such as possessiveness and jealousy, that one might see in couples. That's what I observed personally. I'm sure that there were many others that we just don't know about. I saw photos and a video of a woman who's alleged to be Marishi's daughter. She has an uncanny resemblance to him. We've been gathering information from those willing to come forward and some of the skin boys have told their story. We thank Dr. Rob Gordon. We thank Connie Larson, Casey Coleman, Ned Wynn, who's not with us, Billy Clayton, who's no longer with us. Connie Larson, he said, I myself was so very stupid and innocent in the beginning of me being a Marishi secretary or skin boy, but I couldn't miss wondering since I was the night boy, all the girls that came when I was finished with the massage around two to three in the morning. And this picture, then used to call. And, and this picture is taken from our tour tour, a uh, uh, Scandinavian tour that I arranged for for Marishi, and this is the picture from Finland. Thank you. Uh, he then used to call one girl every now and then, and I always, uh, this is quote quote from Connie. He then used to call one girl every now and then, and I always thought he was dictating a letter or something in the middle of the night. The girls that came last in the night never looked happy when she came out from the 30 minutes audience, but never, but I never thought of it to be a pleasure or sexual meeting. And this is more quotes from Connie. Since I and also so naive, I was so naive. I was. Yeah. Right. Since I also was Marshy's private secretary and skin boy for a while in Salisbury during the 70s, I became suspicious about his celibacy, that he always wanted all us, the M group boys, to uphold around him. I had some nights every week to leave the key to his inner doors in the late hours to some of the regular girls living in the Hotel Coombe. I give no names, of course, but you know who was living there in the upper floors. I was puzzled why I had to leave the key to them at 4.30 every morning instead of leaving them 
to John Gray, who happened to be my co-secretary for the time being. Two, this, is, uh, this is a book, book that Connie wrote. And he says, knowing what I know now, I feel just embarrassed that my master didn't stand up for his sexual lust or love to women. That would have been perfectly okay with me anyhow. But to hide and lie and create an M group that I and many other boys belong to was just a soap opera, I now think. And I have to just insert here that Rob was the first brahmachari that Maharishi made. And you know how hypocritical that was that he made men into brahmacharis and he wasn't one himself. Quote, back quoting Connie again, Jemima Pittman knew it all the time, but she was so in love with a professor and Marshy let this pass just in front of his eyes without doing anything, even if the professor was married and had children. Regarding Marshy's guilt, he is all aware of it for one day after a great F on the roof of his villa under the moonlight and in the protection of the mosquito net, he called for Tatwala Baba, the naked yogi, for his protection and for his cleansing of the ashram. This is what he explained to the lady it, he effed with. They loved each other for years. Also, Dr. Rob Gordon, he has kindly told this story on a couple of Zoom calls. We're all grateful for his impassioned testimony. These are photos of Rob in Rishikesh. The first is Rob with his arm around Ashok. These two skin boys witnessed Judith's comings and goings late at night during the 1970 course in Rishikesh. This is a uh, picture along the path from Marishi's bungalow. Rob is behind Marishi. That's Rob there, right there. Uh, the third is uh, Rob in this picture. I'm circling Rob with his fine Amish-like beard. <laughs> There's Rob. And Susie, if you see anyone you else- in up all of these pictures, man? It's just- amazing. I've been digging up I've been digging up pictures for a very long time because I have tons of pictures in my books, you know? So um, I don't think this one got into either of the books, but I did have it. I did dig, dig it up, yes. And, but I don't see Elsa on this picture and I don't see Connie on this picture. This is from 1969, but it was the fall course of 1969. Perhaps those people were in the January course in 1969. Anyway, right. they, they, yeah, but they, I'm they, the torn, torn course. Yeah, this is fall '69 because I, I had I had a beard until December of '69, and then when Marishi told me to stay on as the skin boy in '70, uh, I I shaved off my beard, but I forgot all about it. <laughs> There's his beautiful beard, raw with his beautiful beard. And then uh, here, this shows Rob and, Aka and Ashok again. Here's Rob with a shaved beard in 1970. And there's Ashok next to him again. All right, then we come to Joyce. Joyce Colin Smith. One of the earliest accounts about Marcy's sexual activities comes from her book, Call No Man Master by Joyce Colin Smith. The time frame is the early 1960s, soon after Marcy came to England during which the author was his personal assistant. Joyce said, quote, around this time, something came out in the news that was completely astonishing to me. Lenin suddenly denounced Marishi in a press conference in the USA, partly on grounds that he apparently had a considerable sex life. Quote, there was a, this is a quote from John Lennon. There was a big hullabaloo about him trying to rape Mia Farrow and a few other women and things like that. Uh, we stayed up all night discussing, was it true or not? We went to see Marishi, the whole gang of us the next day. I was the spokesman. I said, we're leaving. He gave me a look like, I'll kill you, you bastard. I knew then because he gave me such a look, I had called his bluff. Joyce explained, quote, although there is a tradition of religious eroticism in India, Marishi came from a celibate line of spiritual brothers who deny the body and have few physical needs. When we first knew him, he ate little, slept little, wore little clothing against the cold, had few possessions. He seemed all spirit, all light. I don't think any of us who were around him then and looked after him ever associated him in our minds with sexuality. He did not touch us. We did not touch him. He was as unsexy as a young child. 
I'm continuing now, Joyce's quote. Yet, once the gossip began, some of us started to cast our minds back and to see for the first time the significance of a period when he first began locking his door in the afternoons, closeted alone with one young woman or another. Although the hypnotic influence seemed to have kept us unaware of what was going on at the time, we thought him to be giving special tuition to chosen devotees. We now realize something different. There was a certain wide-eyed, fair-skinned type of girl to whom the dark-skinned Indian is frequently attracted. We now saw something he had intended to conceal. He had departed from the holy tradition of his masters as worldly needs had gradually got a hold on him. And this slide is from 1961. I believe this is a photo of Joyce. At least it looks like Joyce. I'm not sure. At the groundbreaking ceremony of Marshi's Meditation Academy in Rishikesh. And this is a slide of Maharishi in 1968, holding hands with Swami Sajidananda and putting his hand on the knee of Tatwala Baba. I always thought it was a weird photo because Tatwala Baba did not take Maharishi's hand, which is awkwardly placed on his knee. The TM movement's official position is that Maharishi was a life celibate. TM devotees discard reports of Maharishi's dalliances as lies, dreams, fantasies, or false memory syndrome. But these are not false memories. These experiences were never forgotten from the time the incidents happened. We who served on Maharishi's personal staff steadfastly believed his claim of life celibacy and followed his directive to remain celibate ourselves. And that so you can read shame. more. You can read more about details, a lot more in these two books that I wrote. And uh, these are some of my other books, my little, my little advertisement <laughs> for my books. Thank you very much, there. Susan. Thank yeah. you very much, Susan, for that very comprehensive presentation, which will help us to a great extent to dispel the uh, uh, the skepticism uh, uh, of people who simply cannot bring themselves to believe that uh, uh, this is the same Maharishi that they came to know. And, uh, you know, truth is the only, radical honesty is the only way that we can make progress now if we're going to bring transcendence to the world. Um, perhaps we can now go to uh, a full audience view. Um, how do I do that so that people can ask questions? Um, Ryan, could I just start with a comment? Uh, yeah, so ab absolutely. At the very earliest part, you intimated that... Um, Mia was not really a moving cause in the Beatles leaving. And I just want the viewers to be reminded that Mia did tell John what had happened to her and to beware about his integrity. And as I understand it, and I defer to your knowledge here, the fact that it happened to Mia before Rosalind was very persuasive so far as convincing the Beatles that the charge was true. And uh, R Richard Blakely confirms that this is also the case. Yeah, oh, thank you for clarifying that. And in fact, Lennon did say it, um, that quote that I gave you of, of Lennon, where he said uh, that Maharishi was getting off with Mia Farrow and other women. He did say that in the press to me the one of the most concerning and significant aspects of this whole case is what happened in Salisburg beginning in 73 74 which indications are continued through the 80s and even through the 90s where there was a, a group of women who expected to be brought a key uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, and the fact that Marshy had, he, he, the, the very fact that he had two apartments, 
one in each building. Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to uh, hard to explain uh, what other reason there could be than to make this convenient. This let's use the word harem. Uh, um, convenient uh, uh, really uh, um, th this is not uh, uh, um, this is not a, a romance uh, this is some kind of uh, uh, something else this is uh, uh, licentiousness it seems to me this is goes far beyond uh, the behavior of somebody in Brahman consciousness. And in Brahman consciousness, uh, as, as Maharishi explained, uh, a person's uh, awareness is established in the gap between absolute and relative, and they're far beyond uh, uh, lust and, and greed. And so, so it indicates that it suggests strongly to us that Maharishi was not in Brahman consciousness. He was not fully enlightened. And that calls into question so much of his judgment. You know, now we have the, the Raja system, which is a, an absolutely absurd, destructive system of administration based on his judgment, supposedly on his uh, divine cognition. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's um, it, 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 we can hardly describe his cognition as divine. It's uh, uh, some very strange kind of behavior. So the, the, the whole thing is called into question. What, what was Marish's uh, achievements then? His achievement was that he took the the, the technique of TM of transcending from the Dandi Swamis. And with tremendous energy and brilliance, he brought it out to the world. And for that, the world has to be very grateful. But beyond that, all of these other behaviors and all of these other so-called cognitions of Paurusha, Abhasya, commentary on the Vedas, is all called into question. So the whole the, the the whole picture changes completely. Brian, you're really true. He was dedicated. I'm reminded of something Casey Coleman said when he finally, as Connie said, had the penny drop. He said, "Rob, you know what amazes me about this? The guy slept even less than I thought he did." And I say that only to point out the man, I'm telling you what, he worked harder than I've ever seen, and he could sit longer without peeing than an elephant. Yeah. This is all true. Very, very true, Rob. <laughs> so, so, you know, he was a, a tremendous paradox, tremendous contradiction. Uh, he was, you know, like a, a giant amongst men, uh, uh, and yet he had this this new and disturbing side that's that's now emerging. And we we don't want to destroy anything that ought not to be destroyed. We want to see transcendence taught in the world. The, the, his his the organization that he left behind the Raja system is destroying his legacy. They're, they're doing nothing. Their the TM is not being taught anywhere uh, to any great extent. Uh, and you know, it's, some alternative has to be found to to rescue those parts of what he brought out to the world, the Dandi Swami technique, and teach it to the world. Do people have questions for, for Susan? Hey, 
uh, uh, not for Susan, but uh, I can tell you from my experience that that Marishi was a very rude uh, person, in fact, and he left cor corpses after his rudeness. And many of my friends, uh, uh, millionaires and uh, and hundred and eight, the one of the boys there, which also was shortly one of his secretary, uh, 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 was burnt in the, since uh, since Marishi left him in Vlodrock uh, uh, there. And uh, uh, when the money was finished, uh, he he was told that he was going to go with with Marishi to India, but the, he left him, and then he became very sick and finally he was living in the basement in the cellar down there and finally uh, uh, he he got into a very bad state since Marishi had betrayed him and uh, when his money was finished he had dropped him and then he burnt himself under Marishi's flat down in the basement to death. That was one of them. There is more yeah, uh, maybe you can tell us about the other lady, Connie. Yeah, yes, the other lady was was Ingrid Engfeld. She was one of the uh, uh, one of Mercy's uh, favorites, also, but not in a sexual way because she was a multi multi millionaire and one of the hundred and eight. Uh, and he, he used to call her or to discuss uh, um, about these. Uh, a, a cassette that uh, they were uh, doing uh, uh, for the sake of spreading the knowledge to the all of the world, these so-called track cassette, and she used all her money, all her father's and mother's money, to manage, uh, start a huge uh, factory in Sweden with 40 em employed people, and, and they were taking over the cassette market, market. and finally, when the money was uh, finished and it, it didn't function because uh, these were making noises, you see, because in Switzerland there were uh, uh, two uh, two people there. One was an American, Peter, and then there was another man, uh, which I do not want to uh, mention by name right now. And uh, they had withheld one of these uh, specific things that has to be in 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 these cassettes chemically. So then uh, they started to make sounds when they were sold out and, and everywhere and people complained. And that finally, uh, when uh, much later, everything went uh, kaput or, or uh, when it uh, made a concourse, then uh, uh, she was hunted down in Harlem in, in, uh, in a very cheap hotel there and uh, she finally got a, a collect call to me and asked me, "Can you please help me so I could come home because I have no money?" And she had she had also been raped in that hotel, and uh, and finally I arranged for a ticket for her to come home. And then as soon as she came home, uh, we uh, uh, to my treatment home because I was having a treatment home for drug addict. Then finally I. I sat down with her and we telephoned to Mercy and and uh, and uh, and he 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 answered and uh, then then uh, 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 she was begging for to come back to uh, to uh, to Vlodrop, I think it was then uh, and uh, uh, because she didn't have not a penny to live on and then finally. She was talking and talking and talking, and suddenly uh, she just realized that when she had hung up the telephone and spit her out. And then she became so uh, 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 upset. So, so then uh, I arranged with the TM teacher that she could move to, to, uh, to Stockholm in a second hand uh, because he was in, going to a course there. Uh, uh, and then uh, finally, if she decided enough is enough, and then uh, uh, she she crossed out uh, uh, all all the Gurudev pictures. She crossed out by uh, uh, 
black. All all the picture of Gurudev wrote a letter uh, and uh, and left the room and went out to to a, a telephone booth and uh, where she she rang me up and since I was knowing her she was always in contact with me. Uh, I know her breath, you see, so I heard that it was her and then I said because she, she had that <laughs> that kind of voice and then I said you have to talk to me in yet I can't help you if you don't talk to me and finally uh, one day uh, uh, she called me up and uh, uh, I heard that it was her and I said please Ingrid you have to you have to speak to me and then it just something exploded in the uh, in the telephone and i thought oh what is going on and then some uh, then uh, then i asked hang up because uh, there was nothing i could do uh, i thought it was broken but uh, finally uh, due to that the man that owed uh, the flat that he has rented out to india came home and find the key passport a, 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 a small amount of money and a letter there written and uh, that was telling that enough was enough so uh, that boom that i heard in uh, 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 when she called me that was when she was out uh, phoning me from a phone boat with a uh, with a gasoline thing and uh, put o over her and put on fire and she just uh, exploded and the only reason uh, that i come to know that was that uh, Man had come home from his course and find everything in 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 her in in his own flat. Then and then the uh, I uh, then the finally the police uh, find out that it was her uh, due to the teeth uh, and uh, the, the teeth was not uh, destroyed, so they could connect to to Malmo where she was living uh, before and having that factory. So that is the so story. she. She she suicide. she immolated herself on the phone with you yes. listening. Yes, and, 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 and listening. It was just poof, and then it was a uh, break. In, and I thought that the line was just broken. But later, well, I was in. Three, I, I was in. I was in Salisburg at that at, at that time, mm. and I remember that. Uh, the the video crew were saying that uh, Marshy had an enterprise to uh, to manufacture these videotapes. The videotapes at that time were very expensive; they had to be cassettes. bought from for, uh, cassettes. It had to be uh, bought from a company in the states, and uh, so they were creating a factory. Everybody was very skeptical because. This was a major technology at the time. I think it was 3M owned the the the, the rights, so they wanted to reverse engineer the uh, uh, how to manufacture these videotapes. So this this woman, cassettes. So this uh, woman who was worth hundreds of millions of kroner was a multimillionaire, hundred and eight. She was, she was duped into uh, yes. building this factory, and this so this goes to finances because we would have to ask ourselves how much of that money w went to Marshi and how much the how much of the money went into actually building the the factory and developing the technology, and you know if, if there was a way to trace back. But it's uh, it's reminiscent of the story of uh, Earl Kaplan, uh, um, yeah. who lost uh, two hundred and fifteen million dollars in a similar scam. So, Brian, Brian was this what they call Vader Vision? Is some member no, in the line? No, no. Uh, they, uh, the, her, her cassette, uh, Ingrid's cassette. Wait, wait. Uh, Ingrid's cassette was was the. Uh, Cassette uh, called track, and and he was taking over uh, the whole uh, uh, cassettes that was going onto the market, 
market and she was very successful in the beginning and they came from Russia they came from everywhere to uh, to buy them and and all stars and everything was coming together with her and and she was so happy but when when uh, they started to make noises then then finally uh, 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 it just went bankrupt uh, rough, uh, and uh, uh, Ingrid uh, might know that uh, she also uh, was hiding in the in, in in the team academy in Norway for a while. Though uh, with uh, 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 Odd there, there was a teacher that was called Odd, and uh, he he protected her as well as I did. But finally, she couldn't manage, and then she burned herself to death. By having putting gasoline over the head. So that this was to replicate or, or reverse engineer the technology of applying magnetic uh, material to the the plastic videotapes, Gary. A, a extremely delicate technology, probably still an extremely delicate technology. But the worst thing you see was that they. They were knowing in in her case, Peter, the, the American, and the Swedish guy. They were knowingly withholding this because they wanted to earn money from that, Robert. Yeah, and the father some... and the mother lost everything also. Really? Yeah, all all money went down. Because they what we call chronophobia in Sweden, that means the one, one that uh, that uh, goes to finally kill uh, kill a business if the banks are saying we can't follow you longer, eh? then they send out a man, and that man was harassing her all over the world. She went to Australia, and she went everywhere to try to hide, but uh, but uh, Marcia didn't care. He just walked as usual. He just forward, never looking back. He just bit them off. He, they were useless, and then uh, he, he used them as long as they were in his grandiosity, uh, following uh, uh, because he finally Marishi was mad. We have just to, to realize that uh, he became a madman. He he lived in some sort of grandiosity, you see. Of, of of being the world savior, while he was in fact a destroyer of the whole it, it transcendental meditation technique uh, and the transcending and the Raya system, it, they are just puppets of this. You can just look at these people. I mean, a, a normal person would would just uh, be flabbergasted and start to to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to I mean, uh, look at them. They are, they are puppets. So something has to be done. Really, really. And I'm very grateful for Susan that has brought all this out from, uh, from her level of knowledge. And there's so much more to come. So I think people should hang on when, they, when we move on to other high than whatever. We will move on to later. Yes, we're we're very grateful to Susan for her painstaking oh. detective work on this really really important subject. Mm. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Uh, some, I just hope it inspires some women to come out of the closet. You know, it. it I hope, hope that it they'll be brave as Judith was. You know, mm. come out of the closet. Mm. Tell tell people about it. Yeah, this is all. This is this is also since I know uh, the Swedish uh, leader uh, that was at the time. Uh, she uh, late late in her life, she admitted that she has been knowing this for all the years. She's been what? Sorry, Connie. She admitted that she had been knowing this for all the years, far back. But really. Uh, yeah, but she she's dead now, so, so we can't 
I can't uh, prove anything by this, but it's not about proving. It's so obvious. I mean, it's... It, 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 this is, it's this is so, sh so shocking that people knew for a long time and didn't say anything. No, they, yeah. they, they went along with it because they were chosen leaders within the organization. I mean, there were those uh, who, when they, as soon as they found out, they left. Yeah. And, you know, this is, uh, and of course, in those early days, there was nothing that you could do except leave. Mm. Uh, but then there were those who were kind of enablers, mm. and they're still around. And it's incomprehensible. How do they rationalize it? I don't understand it. They, they, they knew what was going on. There, were, there are even indications that there are those who think that this is normal behavior and uh, who, you know, in the name of the movement, they're behaving like this. It's, um, yeah, well, human behavior is, uh, uh, there's infinite variety. See when when uh, when one is uh, is uh, twined in on the finger. I mean, uh, for a grandiose psychopath or whatever we we might finally end up at, uh, you can't uh, twine you off. You see, you are trapped. And this is how how these people who that were chosen leaders by him and they were chosen I mean, yeah, either they were chosen as leaders and used or they were chosen as a, a, a mistresses to him so this is a mm. kind of of ruthless way of behaving and Marishi wasn't that uh, that uh, uh, that person that was in brahman consciousness or anything far from it on on saturday um, today's Thursday, where you are. Uh, on Saturday, uh, uh, Connie Zweig, who's uh, an expert in these kinds of things, what's called uh, the shadow aspect of spirituality, is going to be giving us a talk at the same time of day. Uh, so that'll be interesting. She, uh, she's not so much giving us a talk as she'll, she'll make some brief remarks and then uh, answer our questions. And as we try to come to a more of an understanding of what this phenomenon was, uh, because uh, what is the diagnosis? Because Marcia was more than, you know, you can say high functioning sociopath or something, but Marcia was far more than that. He, he was. Uh, uh, a, a, he was a genius. He was brilliant. Uh, he was a brilliant exponent of uh, Vedanta and and the TM. He created the three days checking and the checking notes. Uh, so he had this uh, genius side and this dark side. It's a um, it's a, a new kind of a, a, a new kind of human um, on the association for spiritual integrity website they talk about a, an asura titan which i guess is somebody who's almost enlightened but not quite and has a, a some dark side has yet to go Ryan, who knows yes i have that quote let me just read it real quick Papaji warned, this is the Kali Yuga. Even Rakshasas, demons, will incarnate as teachers to mislead you. And then later on it says, Timothy Conway further writes, Buddhists and Hindus refer to the Asura Titan or demon types of consciousness, which can seem very powerful, very bright, very charismatic and enlightened, but are more insidiously a syndrome afflicting someone who might think he is enlightened but is not because he or she is still fueled by greed, aversion, and delusion. It is especially alluring and misleading when some lovely deva, kar deva karmas are mixed in, such as certain talents or virtues. 
such a combination Deva, of Deva karmas. Yeah. You mean karmas of of demigods? Sit cities such a combination of powerful light and dark entities can be very confusing so it's going to be interesting if connie can pull some threads together for us because if there was this discrepancy this darkness at the very core operating all the time then we get to see how that's played out in the history of the movement up to the present because we're not just interested in finding out what he did he's not here but in all all of that karma and all those characteristics, how the leaders of the movement, how the policies have continued to warp and corrupt and deceive. And and so I'm I'm hoping that we can, of course, the finances will come up next. So that's going to be pretty shocking as well. Yes. Can, I, can I comment on it just? But that was his skill. I mean, I, as a ruthless businessman, he has nothing else. But he brought out a technique that he was taking from someone else, so, uh, from real people. And this is what he brought out, you see, uh, that finally became this uh, tremendous uh, uh, organization for good and bad. And uh, for us that was uh, uh, following this, it became clearer and clearer. And now we are just in that position or telling the truth since we have gone through through the whole process we know who he, he is we know what he was striving for and we also know that he was ruthless in uh, talking bad about other people behind their back because this is what he did all the time when i was his secretary i, yeah. I can confirm that connie and i think that's I think that's one of the ugliest things, how, how he, he completely really disrespected everyone that was in the movement unless they had zeros in their bank account. And you know, True. there was no cosmic calculus in picking the Rajas. He just asked them how many zeros were in their checking. <laughs> that, that, was the, that was the criterion of choice. One million dollars. Yeah, let's also remember that uh, he did not know Sanskrit. He was far from a Sanskrit scholar. He depended upon Vernon Katz for that. His interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita is basically bunk. And so far as his Vedic wisdom, I mean, you just say the same thing over and over and pluck some petal from a flower and give a smile. He didn't deliver any earth-shaking message or say anything that wasn't known. What he had was a tremendous ability to sell himself. He had tremendous charisma. He had an ability to influence and get people to carry out his will. But let me remind you folks, every con man must have exactly these same characteristics. One might also call call it uh, asuras or rakshasa uh, uh, part of of the teaching. So, uh, unless there are other questions before we close. I continue to feel that something good has to come out of this. We have to be able to create an organization to teach transcendence, a genuine organization, not, not an organization like the Raja organization, which it seems as if it's designed to destroy uh, whatever Marshi left. It, it really seems as if... Uh, the Raja organization is deliberately created uh, as a kind of um, self-destruct mechanism uh, to, to destroy whatever Marshi left. Uh, um, but and this, bringing the money and bringing the money to India. I, I guess a last, um, a last fling, a last few millions from wealthy people in the movement. Uh, 
But that, that's disappearing fast because the Rajas are old and they're passing away and there's not much left there. Uh, and the, the, the movement is, you know, not teaching anybody. But this transcending works. And it, it, uh, it, it doesn't seem to improve the moral character, the spontaneous right action. It doesn't seem to be a thing. It does do something. It does uh, give inner happiness. It does give clearer thinking. It does give beautiful experiences. It seems like we have to offer it to the world. I don't know what other people think. I don't know. Um, it, it, some people are doing their own techniques and so on um, now. But um, I would like to see transcendence talk, taught in the world. And I believe that it's possible because... Uh, we can simply take the Dandi Swami's technique and and make it available. Brian? So that's, Brian? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I would like to say something to the women. I, don't, I have no idea how this may filter out to the women who have not yet come out to speak of their experiences. It can, we be... first, can we first introduce you as a, a, a very long-term TM teacher and a psychotherapist and a, a, a person with expertise in, in numerous other areas? Thank you. I would just like to say it. the experience is it becomes a lot easier the more have come out and um, we have two pioneers who who courageously have come forward uh, Teresa and and Judith and we know that it uh, takes a lot of courage I personally know that as well um, I have been in a in a, holding a story like that as well in my private life I know it's difficult and we know from the Me Too movement that it is difficult for the women to come forward, but also that it becomes easier and easier the more have come before you. And, of course, if you don't want to be uh, seen or your name to be known, there are always ways how you can be interviewed and um, it can be um, spoken by an actress or it, um, uh, the voice can be distorted. There are multiple ways. Um, it is very, very liberating. I know this from uh, a number of, of my uh, clients and patients um, and from my own life. I also know it from coming out of the closet very, very, very slowly uh, in terms of being part of the uh, TMO the TM organization or not. I have hesitated a long time to let it be known that I am not part of that spiel anymore. And I, even that has been a huge liberation. So I can only encourage everyone to, to take heart and come out and for a while yeah it's it's all up in the air and we don't know what uh, how we should feel about it all but it is very liberating and you have a community of people here who are here to to um, be with you and support you and you are held. So, lot of love. Thank you. Thank you, Sibylla. Brian? Brian? Yes. On this note of hopefulness, would you permit me to lead, read four lines from Tantric Scripture? Please. You've just muted yourself, though, by mistake. There you go. From pure joy springs all creation. By joy 
it is sustained towards joy, it proceeds, and to joy, it returns. And what's your interpretation of, of that, Rob? In terms of uh, action steps? I, I'm not so sure that determines our action steps. What it does is expresses the basic view of Tantra and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau and Margaret Fuller. It expresses the belief that we've been taught by the proof of evolution operating on our planet that the story of creation is ever ascending forms and development. So in that faith, the belief is that everything that happens is part of the joyful creation and it's all happening in a way to bring about the final enlightenment of all sentient creatures upon the earth. Well, it's, we couldn't hope to hear a better um, projection than that, uh, a, a better a picture of reality than that. Thanks, Rob. So we've been going uh, a small matter of three and a quarter hours. Uh, shall we, unless there are other questions or other comments, uh, thanks again to Susan for a magnificent job. And uh, you're welcome. Uh, it was a lot of work, <laughs> but I did it. It was, it was a huge <laughs> amount of work. And, uh, uh, you know, I think there's, there can be no doubt about the picture of r reality that emerges. Uh, um, and uh, as Sibylla says, we hope that more women will come forward. And I think it's uh, it, it's inevitable that they will. Uh, uh, and because, you, you know, I have so many friends. I've lost so many friends, good friends, over this over the last few weeks, the last three months, who simply, you know, have been totally dedicated uh, to the movement and to Marish's knowledge for for 30 40 50 years and i wonder what it takes um, to convince them that their picture of reality is is flawed